please take up your Bibles. We're reading from John 19, beginning at verse 28 to 42, the death of Jesus. Later knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with his spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it was given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And, as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning to each one. So for those of you who are new or here for the first time here at TLC in this uh, service, we're going through the Gospel of John. We're going uh, passage by passage, and today we land on this particular uh, passage of Scripture. Uh, a portion of it, you'll notice from last week to this week, a portion of it is missing. Uh, that's simply because that was covered already at Easter time. And so it, it was uh, gone over, and so we're moving on to verse 28 today. And so it's, it's always a dilemma how much to pick and choose. Uh, if, if we were to take everything in the notes, we'd have to serve lunch and supper on this. <laughs> It's, it's loaded, but we'll try to keep it uh, limited here. And to see why did Jesus die? What's the result of that? And uh, when he rose, rose again, we'll be, we'll be coming. But th there's tremendous, tremendous power in the actual death of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And the, the death of Jesus is such life. It almost seems like a paradox, but we cannot have life unless we understand the death of Jesus. And so that's what we want to go through. So starting off with the first few verses, uh, from verses, uh, starting with verse 28. And after this, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, he said, note this now, and a lot of translations have it in brackets, to fulfill scripture, I thirst. A jar of sour wine stood there, and so they put a sponge in the, in, of sour wine on his branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed and gave up his, his, his spirit. Uh, just a comment on this. We won't elaborate very much on the two words of Christ. The first one is, I thirst. And if, uh, to, to get more on that, you're welcome to look at our website and on our YouTube. Uh, for years, we were going through every Easter, we would do the seven last words of Jesus on the cross. 
And so rather than repeat, you can just go back on the website, look at that. And, uh, but I do want to pull out just a couple of pointers here for us this morning because our passage uh, does cover. When he said, I thirst, he's basing it on uh, Old Testament uh, t- uh, uh, words that were given and pulling it up for a specific purpose. Why does this happen? Uh, Matthew does this probably the most But all the gospel writers do it, and of course John does it as well, even though he's writing primarily not to Jewish people. He's writing to people who, this is now probably about a good uh, six decades, uh, or maybe anywhere between three or four decades to five decades later, after Jesus uh, had died and ascended, he's writing this gospel account, and therefore a lot of people we're not familiar with the Old Testament, so he does throw it in here to tell us one thing, that the life, death, and burial, and resurrection, and ascension of Jesus is not a reaction of any type to God uh, about what happened on this earth. Rather, it's his active plan from the beginning to uh, give us a plan of redemption, a way of salvation, and that is through his son, Jesus Christ. And so, for instance, in Psalm 22, 15, it says, My strength has dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. He also makes quote, or the allusion to this verse in Psalm 69, verse 21. They gave me gall for food, and my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. So if you, if you take a look at the word history, we often just think of things in the past. But all history, all history, and we've seen this in this country as well, when certain books come in, uh, they are people assigned to rub out and to actually cut out and, or white out or eliminate certain parts of history that are factual. Now, by deleting information, by deleting it's ignoring. And by not pointing out certain things, it's misleading. None of us, no human being, has the capacity to write historically correct. None of us. All of us have an agenda when we talk about history. Just think of your last family reunion. Husband and wife and children go to the same family reunion. Two years later, you ask them about that family reunion, you're going to get as many people as were there, as many different versions of what happened at that. And each one could be absolutely correct. Everyone could be absolutely correct in what they say. It's just every one of us, we choose to remember certain things. We choose to forget certain things. And we all choose to highlight certain things. And so we, as humans, have a tendency to skew history. Uh, This is what is so valuable about the Bible. We have one author working through over about 40 people over the space of about 1,500 years. And it's amazing they come with one historical record. The line and the plot and the theme is the same. And that's only possible when you have one author And he was there from the beginning. And, can I say this also? He also, God also has an agenda. He also selected certain things and didn't say other things. How many questions do we have? I have. How many questions do I have? What about this? What happened here? What happened here? God knows. I don't know. One day in heaven, I can ask him. (laughs) We can ask him. One thing that we are assured about, this is his story for us. And he is telling us, I have given you this for one purpose and for life. This is for life. So for true, genuine living. So if we want genuine life, we have to look at the one who makes life and read the manual that he gave. And so we can arrive at living life in abundance here on this earth. And if we substitute his authority for any other authority, we will not be able to live out in the fullness of life. 
And so what, what uh, John does here is what the other gospel writers do. They always pull back to the Old Testament and to help the readers then recognize that this Jesus of Nazareth who came and, and in this particular context died for us, okay, there's a reason for it. It's connecting back to a plan that God had, and this is now the execution of that plan, as we will see also as is the resurrection and the ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit. All of these things are given to us for our good. Okay, let's uh, move on to the, uh, in the same verse, uh, we're going to look at a different aspect. We're talking about the earthly mission accomplished by Jesus. And after this, verse 28, knowing that all was now finished. Um, skip down to the bottom, 30. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What is, what we often unfortunately say, and, and we say it because of the context, is that the Pharisees and religious leaders killed him, or Pilate killed him, or the Roman soldiers killed him. Uh, we, we, we often regurgitate certain phrases and sayings, but they're not true. Nobody killed Jesus. Nobody. No one. No one killed Jesus. What does the scripture say? Yeah, Jesus was not murdered. He was not murdered. He died on his time. And him and the Father were one. And when his mission was accomplished, and this is his last word of the seven words on the cross, his last one, it is finished. What is finished? His mission. That's what's finished. We, we sometimes talk in terms of, uh, you know, people dying prematurely. We'll leave that in God's hands. We'll leave that in God's hands. When one's life mission, when, when it's done, God calls his saints home. You've done what I asked you to do, come home. And that's why it's important to do God's will. And some people, like Jesus, live a very short time. Very short on this earth. Of all the people, we would say Jesus died prematurely. That's what we would say. I would say that. Why couldn't he have lived longer? Why, why couldn't Jesus have traveled and gone to Africa, to Asia, to, to the Americas back then? Why didn't he do that? You know, did, did, couldn't the father wait and, and, and send him around? No, he had a mission and he had a commission. And when his mission was done, when it was accomplished, Jesus recognized it and he was in tune with his father. And in his spirit, he knew it's done. How many times in the Gospel of John, you've studied it as you're going through this, and I trust you've read the book of John in one setting. If you haven't yet, please do so before we finish the book of John. Read it in one setting. And one of the phrases that keeps coming up is, it's not yet my time, Jesus would say. It's not yet time. And he says it over and over and over again. And even coming down to Jerusalem, his brothers, his own family was saying, Oh, okay, if you really are who you say, why don't you go to Jerusalem and show yourself? And he says, no, it's not my time. It's not my time. And then there comes a place in John where he says, it is my time to reveal himself. And progressively we see Jesus releasing the progressive revelation of who he is. And here on the cross, it's the final time where he says, the time has come. My hour has come. I've done what I had to do. And so make this, let's make this our prayer. That we live, live so in unity with the Father. We understand His will. We're led by the Spirit. So we know who we are. So that we don't walk around this life aimlessly. We can't do that. We can't afford it. What Jesus packed into those three years is absolutely amazing. And John, at the end of his book, he says that. He says that the, that the heavens were scrolls. It, we, we couldn't contain all of that, what Jesus did and said, and the big picture that's behind here. But he did what his father asked him to do. And so in absolute contentment, although in excruciating pain, but content in his spirit, he acknowledged his father's will and said, it's finished. He bowed his head and released his spirit. Verse 31 is another interesting uh, bit of uh, information. 
Since it was a day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that his, their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Um, you know, among some of the uh, arguments that are used that the Bible is, is contradictory and it doesn't make sense and all this stuff that, that there's internal, this is one of them where, where people will say, just looking at simple math, Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the earth, uh, three nights and three days, so, so shall the Son of Man be. Well, you don't have to be a very brilliant mathematician <laughs> to figure out that if you die Friday night and rise up Sunday morning, you're not covering three nights and three days, okay? So what, what's the problem with this contradiction here? And... Um, uh, tonight we're going to be doing expository preaching and uh, teaching for uh, in our for our church along with a couple of other churches here, and so one of the dilemmas always is to what extent do we want to tackle history? So we've got church tradition for a couple of thousand years now that has celebrated Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, um, but just for the record. <laughs> This is not accurate, okay? Just, just to make that clear, okay? You, you, you can't come to those numbers. But here's a, here's a verse that gives us the insight, and uh, we often ignore it. Well, it was, uh, it was, um, there's a Sabbath every, every week, right? Every seven days, Sabbath. But when the Sabbath falls on special feast days, just look at your translation. Please look to see what it says. This one, ESV, says that was a high day. Does anybody have a different translation? My wife read one in NIV. Anybody else here with an NIV? It was a pass. A special Sabbath because it was Passover week. Anybody else with a different translation? A high day. High Sabbath. Okay. So some stuff is lost in history. Some stuff is lost in history. But there was the point of what John is making here, and he's, again, identifying something here for the reader several decades later. Because it was the Passover, in, in all likelihood, what's going on here is another day is shoved in here. And all of a sudden, the calculator works. It comes together. You get your three nights and the, the special time that is there. And these, these are just a little indicators that sometimes we just slip by. But we have to know these things because if, if people ask you, uh, if, if your calculator is working or not, you have to be able to give an answer. And so John helps us with that. And so this uh, extra uh, uh, high Sabbath helps explain how we get to the three days and three nights. So, um, so then why do we still continue to celebrate Friday and Sunday? <laughs> um, life's too short to start changing calendars. All right. We leave certain things, just like Jesus, in all likelihood, uh, the chances of him having been born on December uh, 25th, or the night of the 24th, is probably one in a thousand or something, or one in, one, in, in, one in 365. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Uh, no broken bone. Why was this mentioned here? Uh, take a look here. Um, it says here, because of this high Sabbath, okay, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they may be taken away. And so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first one. And then the other, who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. For these things took place, the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Uh, just before we get into those passages, uh, just very something quick about the, 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 what happened when a person was on a cross um, of course, what happens, they can't go anywhere, and so they're basically going to die from, could be multiple reasons why they die. Um, but, and the Romans, frankly, weren't concerned about how long it takes them to die. In fact, the point of the punishment is that they suffer. That was the whole point, why they use crucifixion. Um, There's other ways of, of public uh, or capital punishment that are much uh, quicker, much faster, and it takes literally seconds. But th this was the system back then. 
And so a person could be on the cross easily a couple of days uh, beyond there. But to speed up the process, when they're hanging there, and there'd be generally uh, feet, would, of course, would be uh, roped in or nailed in, and uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps a small platform for their feet, perhaps not. But, of course, as they're starting to die, you need air. Air is one of the last things that you need, and when you have no more air, you're finished. So in order to breathe when you're shrinking, you've got to pull yourself up. Now, if your legs are broken, how do you pull yourself up? And so the quick way of doing it is break their legs. And, and actually, the word is not break. It is smash. They would take a, a mallet and just literally just smash them into splinters. Um, just to speed up the process. And so not so much that it was cruel. It just speeded up, sped up the, uh, the death. And so the, because of this extra Sabbath that was shoved in there, um, they wanted the, the, the bodies off. And so, okay, do what you normally do. Go, go smash their legs. And so they smash the one, they smash the other. They come to Jesus, and he's already dead. Um, therefore, they did not smash his legs. Is it a coincidence? No, these things were prophesied. If you take a look at in Exodus 12, verse 46, and the first lead up to this was the, um, because Jesus died on the Passover, they had the Passover lamb. And when you read through in Exodus 12, 46, when it talks about the lamb that they had to take, they had to take a lamb uh, that did not have any broken bones. In other words, it was supposed to, the, the death of the, the animal was supposed to be humane and uh, do it um, kosher. Uh, other countries have issues of halal. There's, there's, everyone has some religious way of um, sacrificing animals. And so back then, when the nation of Israel was being formed, uh, very, the instructions were very explicit about the Passover lamb. And it was that very lamb that was supposed to be pure, without blemish, without any broken bones. Its blood was to be put on the door. And this morning, Adele and the team led us in many songs about the blood. And it's the blood of Jesus, the blood that was given up for you and for me. When, when the enemy tries to come by, we can say, and we can sing, I'm under the blood. <laughs> I'm under the blood. Satan has no authority. And just as the death angel came through the camp, and all those who took the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost, the death angel had no authority in that house to kill the firstborn. But where there was no blood, the firstborn died. Right from the lowest of the slaves to the Pharaoh himself. Verse uh, Psalm 34, 20 he says, He protects all his bones and not one of them will be broken. And so all of this is in keeping with what is going on there. Move on to, back to our text, move on to verse 34. I'm just going to take the two verses here, 34 and 37. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and, and, once, uh, and at once there came out blood and water. And 37, again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. So what happened now, they did not break his bones because they saw he was already dead. And they were surprised. And it's no wonder that the uh, centurion looked up and said, for sure, this is the Son of God. Because he's, he does this all the time. And he knows that people don't die that fast. Especially when you're only 30-some years old, young, healthy, strong. Should have been up there for several days. And so he recognizes there's something different here. Um, he... <laughs> Let's, I don't want to skip ahead here. The, we sang about the blood this morning. Um, the blood and the water that was there. This, this dying on the cross, because the, in the early days, we're going to be going in September. We're, we'll be finishing John in, um, by September, and then September we'll start with Colossians. Um, when we go into the, some of the epistles, one of the things that will come up is that in the early church, there's a lot of debate about the, uh, doctrines and uh, who is Jesus. And uh, what, what, what was the connection between 
Jesus, how could he be fully man and yet fully God? And how does this work? And how do you put two together? And who is the essence of Jesus? And they didn't have the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, this came up uh, sometime later because our human brain always wants to extract from Scripture, put a doctrine together, put a little bow tie on it and put it together and say, this is what we believe in this. We, we don't like obscurities. We don't like unanswered questions. Um, so the early church was grappling with this. And uh, no doubt already when John was writing this gospel, there's already rumors about who is Jesus. Was he actually, uh, was he just God who came down uh, in a human form or the image of God? Or, or was he born fully a man and God made him the son of God and gave a divinity into him? And all these kind of questions went through. What, what this here tells us and helps us understand is that no, he was fully human. He was fully human in the sense that he had blood. He faced all things that we faced. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, immune to sorrows, joys, uh, sadnesses, sickness, emotional items, um, and, and physically also. But, but there is a difference because we have enough doctors in the house that could testify more on this. Having a divine father and a human mother would necessitate that his blood is different than ours. In order for our blood to be the blood that it is, requires DNA from both a man and a woman. And he was born of the Holy Spirit. And there is something special about the blood. And that's on this point it would be easy now to divert and spend three or four hours on this and getting into Hebrews as well and all this. But his blood does live forever, making intercession for us. It is there. There is something divine about the blood of Jesus. And this is why he gave up his life. And they didn't have to break his bones. And when they pierced his side... It was proof that he was already dead. Now these, uh, these soldiers were just that. They were soldiers. They probably were not that highly educated or trained. And in the world of science then, in medical, they would have been trained. And so when someone dies, there's a, as today, there's someone who gives a death certificate to confirm, yes, this person is dead. And then, if needed, an autopsy is there as to why they, why they died. But here is a sample of a, a layman who's not a medical person. And this soldier, well, is this guy dead or not? And he takes a spear and shoves it in his side. And if water and blood come out, he's dead. Okay? Death certificate. So when we're talking about the blood of Christ, because we, we sing songs like this. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Well, how does this come? Because, uh, well, it, the blood came several times. Right? It comes first on the crown of thorns that they put on him. Blood flowed there. Jesus prayed with tremendous intercession. Now you want to talk about being heavy in soul? When your soul is agonizing? You know, we, when we pray... And we have got a circumstance in front of us, and it could be anything. It could be a, a relational problem, a financial problem, a medical problem, whatever problems we've got, whatever mountain we've got. Uh, we don't know the fullness of it. We just see this huge mountain. Jesus knew the mountain he was before. And that's why he prayed, if possible, let this cup pass from me. He knew very well what was coming. He wrote the book. And so his agony, his soul was in agony to the extent that he sweat drops of blood. His entire body reacted to the agony of his soul. And then within a few hours on the cross, his blood flowed again. His blood did flow for you and for me. And I know it's not popular. And that's why, thank you, Adel, again for picking some of these songs here that aren't that popular because when we come to church 
we, we want a smile, we want friends, we want a nice, nice environment. And, and talking about blood is not quite the favorite theme to talk about. But unless we understand the blood of Jesus, that his blood was shed for you and for me, we will never enter into the fullness of life because life is found in the blood. And that's why the Old Testament was so adamant about how we treat the blood, even of animals. And the responsibility, and even if a neighbor's cow dies in your yard, the responsibility you have. Why? Because life is important, and life is in the blood. And so Jesus, uh, of all the Old Testament, you can wrap the whole thing up and, and present it in Jesus. His blood was shed for you and for me. And without the blood, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There's no remission of sins. It cannot happen. Because somebody had to give up life. And this started already in the garden. We don't read about it, and this is what we call about progressive revelation. As we read the Bible progressively, we are revealed certain things. But God was the one who made the first sacrifice when Adam and Eve sinned. And so he sacrificed an animal and took their skin and put it on them for a covering. And atonement has always been directly connected with the blood. But we thank God that this, what we are reading about now, was the last of the sacrifice. It's done. It's over. Never again, ever again, will there ever have to be a sacrifice. Ever. Ever. Never. So please don't get all excited and start reading and doing all things of what they're doing over in Jerusalem and building another temple and building all... Who cares? Read this. Read this. When you read about that, about them building another temple and starting to sacrifice, understand one lesson. These are the signs of the times that the end is coming near. It does not have religious significance for us at all. At all. Because Jesus was the final sacrifice. And if anyone's eyes, as a Christian, is fixated on Jewish traditions and religions... Let me warn you this morning, repent and turn back to Jesus. Yes. Repent of having taken your eyes off of Jesus and looking at Judaism. Please, please. This is crippling the church. and We're watching Christians get sucked into this. Either Jesus' death was final and full or it wasn't. And that's the very story that the New Testamenters are writing about. And Paul writes to the Galatians and says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And why have you taken your eyes off of Jesus and you're looking at sacrifices and you're looking at new moons and celebrations? It's over. It's finished. Jesus is our Savior. He is the Lamb of God that died. And this is picked up again in the book of Revelation. Who is worthy? Who is worthy to unroll the scrolls? Who is he? The blood. Jesus, the one, the lamb that died and gave up his blood for you and for me. Very important. So they pierced his side. Um, on Sunday night, we're going through 1 John. And so you can refer back to the messages in John, but he talks about, and this, of course, the same author, uh, he, he, he's writing about the blood of Jesus, and he's talking about the humanity of Jesus. Again, probably the, the letters of John, probably written later after the Gospels, um, he, he, and he's talking there, probably defending the Christian faith and explaining the Christian faith to again say that the, the humanity of Jesus, uh, that's the one component in addition to the divinity of Jesus because John is very clear on that. J Jesus is the word. He's the life. He he's the light. Uh, all of that. But he's also human. And he came with water and with blood. And again, if we could, uh, without diverting too much here, but if, if, we, if we simply look at John's context in his letters when he writes about this. Uh, all of us were carried by our mothers for nine months in water. Our blood, flesh, 
our blood comes from the, is on the inside and we don't see it we see the outside not the inside and so it is with character so it is with thought so it is with intention so it is with our mind and so it is with our emotions those are things of the outside our flesh reveals it if you're happy it's revealed if you're sad it's revealed okay but it's on the inside just like our blood is on the inside and so is the blood on the inside revealed. If it is sick, if our blood is sick, it will be revealed on the outside. And so both the outside, the physical body, and our soul have to be alive. And so in John, when he writes about it there, body, soul, and spirit, and the spirit of Jesus, and these three testify. Um, but here in this particular passage, he's talking specifically now about the physical life, the water, and the blood. And in Matthew 27, verses 24 and 26. In fact, let's read that, please. Let's turn with me to, with Matthew 27, verses 24 to 26. 27, 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And the people answered, His blood be upon us and our children. And he released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, again, blood, uh, Jesus delivered him to be crucified. And so it's amazing how often the Bible re refers to and identifies Pilate, this a Roman governor who was there. And what he tried to do was symbolically wash his hands with water and thereby saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. Well, he wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't. <laughs> he was guilty as well. Uh, his wife had enough sense and talked to him. Uh, he didn't listen. And he went ahead with a plan. Could have been differently? Of course. You know, and then this comes in with the, with the plan of God. Um, we, we, we make choices. We make choices. And could Pilate have chosen? Well, if we understand the Bible correctly, everyone has a choice. And he could have. In something else, some other way, he would have ended up on the cross. And so, here we have it. He tries to wash his hands and get away from guilt. Uh, none of us can wash away our sins. We can't dunk our hands in water and wash away sins. Uh, it is the issue of the heart. And so just as Pilate washed his hands, it was just a reflection of his heart. He wanted nothing to do with this. He wanted nothing to do with it. He could have. He should have. In fact, he did. He was the one who pronounced the sentence. And so it comes back to us, what are we going to do with Jesus? And we can't just wash our hands, symbolically saying, and say, well, this doesn't matter. That Every time God's Spirit speaks to us, every time we have an opportunity to do something for God, when His Spirit speaks to us, we have to listen to the voice in the inside and simply do what He asks us to do. And this brings us to the next point in verse 38 and 39 of two men who were struggling. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea is the first time we hear of him, but not so with Nicodemus. So here's this uh, Joseph, and he was a disciple of Jesus. Uh, notice what it says here, but secretly, okay, secretly, uh, because he feared the Jews. So uh, interesting character here. And uh, please remember, this was written decades afterwards, and they're going back. And so when you, when you read it, you, you can't help but chuckle a little bit about the humor in this, because here he's trying to be secret about his discipleship, but for the last 2,000 years, this was revealed that uh, who, who he is, who he was. Anyways, he goes to Pilate, so he's somebody with connections. Okay? He's got uh, uh, Wasta. He's he, probably, one of the, probably one of the Sanhedrin, I don't know. But um, 
he, he goes there. And, and what's interesting, it's not just that he goes to Pilate. It's not just that he goes there. Pilate honors it. So definitely a man of standing, some type. And Pilate honors to him and says, okay, go ahead and take, knowing full well that this cr quote-unquote criminal is not the same as every other one. He knows that. He, he himself testified, I find no fault with him. There's no reason he should be on the cross. And so probably also, just to hurry up the process, he probably also said, yeah, please go and do it with speed. <laughs> Get him off there. Uh, Nicodemus, also interesting. You remember Nicodemus, John chapter 3? Comes to Jesus at night. Why does he come at night? Probably the same reason. Fear. Maybe, we don't know. But he came. That's the beauty. He came. Uh, Nicodemus, the Greek word, uh, based from Nike, um, just, just do it, just do it. Uh, a victor, overcomer, that's what the word means, to be an overcomer. Nicodemus, an overcomer. And we can see a progression with him, coming to Jesus, questioning, and by the time we come to the end, he's, he's, he's the one who stands there and he helps, and uh, uh, so much so that he buys about 75 pounds worth of, of uh, ointment. Uh, that's a lot of, that's a lot of, uh, perfume for a dead body that's a lot um, they're they're ready to put him into the tomb for a long time I, I don't know we don't know how much they knew and we can assume very little of how much they knew that Jesus said I will rise again after three days and why do we know it because even his own disciples who spent all the time with him forgot that Jesus said I'm only there dead for three days. He told them that. They'd forgotten. Memory, as I mentioned earlier, history, it's selective. We want to remember the good stuff. And when we find obstacles in front of us, such as they did, Jesus died, all their dreams and aspirations, um, especially the sons of thunder, whose, whose mother was also hoping that each boy could sit on the left and the right. All of them had their own personal aspirations about the kingdom of God and what he was going to do. Everyone comes with their own agenda. And uh, just as this morning, um, we won't ask why you came this morning. <laughs> but everyone comes with a different agenda, uh, to, e even to church. A and even for being a disciple, what's the agenda? What, what's going on? Do we, and when we start unearthing these things, and, and please keep in mind, it's not, it's not a matter of pointing out our fingers. I, I can tell you at the age of nine, when I accepted Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, and it was absolutely genuine, it was God's Spirit speaking to my spirit, my spirit yielded to His Spirit, it was a born-again experience, absolutely. But I can also say it was also selfish. The primary agenda was very selfish. Because I heard about hell, <laughs> I didn't want to go there. I heard about heaven, and I did want to go there. Okay? That was a motive. That was an agenda. But thank God since then, it's grown. And I understand about the love of God and His compassion. I understand about the bigness of it. And now, hell, heaven, I'm not in hell, not yet in heaven. I don't, it's now. I'm living Jesus has given me life now, fullness of life now. And I enjoy that and I know that the future is even brighter, regardless of whatever problems come ahead. And so we come to this with our, per all of us could have a similar story. And uh, Nicodemus is one like that as well. He may not have started off that well, and we don't know about his future, but we see progress here uh, with him, uh, coming out publicly as an identifier with Jesus. He could have. He was, Joseph was in the Sanhedrin. He could have stayed back, stayed at home, and closed his eyes and says, whatever they do with Jesus, let's leave it. But he didn't. He got involved. He came out publicly and did something. As, by the way, so did Joseph uh, to some degree. What's interesting when we go through in a gospel account, and the beauty about having four accounts as a reminder, again, we only have one gospel, but we have four accounts of it, okay? Um, is when you look at Matthew, Matthew 27, verse 59 and 16, so I put it up here for you, that you can, you can have it. The, the, the tomb that Jesus 
used. That, that, that was the, in the verse that I talked about. Uh, let's look at the same um, or the passage moving on to 41. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now, this is John's account. And so the impression is that because it's close by, uh, well, let's, well, let's just use this one conveniently. Uh, now, remember, all history is selective, and that's why you need different witnesses on one to make the fuller story. So we turn to Matthew, Matthew 27, verse 59 and 16. Look at this here, what Joseph had, or, um, Matthew has to say. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. So this Joseph guy, obviously a man of, of uh, standing, man of wealth. Um, I know when my, years ago, probably about 15 years ago, um, my parents uh, went down to the, the local funeral home and, and bought or leased, whatever term they use, a plot of land so that when they pass away, that we as children don't have to worry about that. We just put, put them into the casket. And I remember thinking, I said, I, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> I don't want to hear. Um, but it's a place where they're going to rest. And they did. They both passed away and they're both uh, buried there. Uh, it, it is something that even Joseph had prepared for himself, but I believe divinely inspired. So, so what my parents did is nothing new. This is I'm doing this for millennia, preparing to uh, just go down to Egypt. We think the pyramids are. That's what the pyramids are, as the Pharaoh prepared for his burial. So um, here Joseph uh, prepares his tomb. But Matthew gives a different slant on this. Look at what Matthew 27 says. And so when he takes his own tomb that he had cut out of rocks, uh, th this is now all human indicators that he's giving it to Jesus, which means that maybe I have to make another one. <laughs> but there's other significance with this. Uh, why all this security? Why all the stone, the seals, the guards? Look at Matthew 27, uh, 62. Um, if you go on to some verse, you got, I hope you have your Bible. I don't have it on the overhead here. In, in Matthew chapter 27, verses 62, the next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests, the Pharisees, gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise again. Isn't it interesting, huh, that even his enemies remembered well the words of Jesus and his own disciples forgot. Okay? They remembered. Jesus said, I will rise again. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. And so Pilate says to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. I mean, you talk about a high security uh, uh, a tomb. So what's the deal about this? Well, those of you that have ever been in, in Rome or other places where they have the catacombs where they actually have these burial spots, uh, they, they're public, you can go there. And, um, and I remember going down in, in some of these here and it gives you kind of a bit of an eerie feeling thinking that you're actually going into a basically a, a funeral or a, a, a cemetery, which just, it goes on a long ways, these, these uh, caves underground. And this is where actually the early church met because of fear of the, or because of persecution, etc., etc. Anyways, the significance of Jesus going into a tomb that had not yet been used, and just back then they also had tombs with multiple bodies in it, is also the obvious, another obvious reason. Because had there been other bodies in there, had this been a regular catacomb, what would happen? Well, you've always got friends and relatives and loved ones who come back at a later time, correct? And there'd be people there. But with him being the only one in there, no one else is going to go in there. And now to make that up, so that's why a, a tomb by itself. Then also you roll a stone in front of it, then you put a seal on it, then you put the guards in it. For sure, nobody can come. 
And all of these things point and add significance to the very fact for Sunday morning <laughs> when Jesus comes out of the tomb. Nobody did tinker with the body. No one stole it, nothing. Even the, Mary was still confused, thought he was the gardener. Where, where did you put him? We didn't put him anywhere. He was there. We left him there. And so John's account here is very clear to us that for sure there was no tampering with the body for the three days. It's secure. So how did he come alive? The Spirit of God raised him up. And the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive in you and me. It's the same power that can give us life. If the Spirit of God can raise Jesus from the dead after three days, how much more can he help you and me over our troubles and our circumstances? And we don't have to rely on anything else. I often wonder, why did Matthew pick this up and not the others? <laughs> he was a tax collector. <laughs> he, he was used to bribes and corruption. That was his life. And so he, of all the gospel writers, he picks this up. And, and that's what they said. And, and um, take a look at verse chapter 28. We're still in Matthew. Matthew 28 and 11. And of course, um, Jesus does rise from the dead. And now they got a dilemma because they put the, his own tomb. The stone was there. Security guards are there. The seal is there. And the very fear that they had that Jesus would rise from the dead happened. And, and um, so now they really got an issue to deal with. And... Uh, they don't want to admit that Jesus rose from the dead. Let's fabricate a story. Verse 11, chapter 20, verse 11. And while they were going, behold, some of the guards went to the city and told the chief priests what had taken place. And when they had assembled to the elders and taken counsel, they gave a significant sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were sleeping. Of course, we're going to get in trouble with this, right? And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him, i.e., will bribe him, and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Only a tax collector would remember this story. <laughs> the other gospel writers don't write about it. Let's conclude. Back to John 19, 41 and 42. Now the place where the, he was crucified, there was a garden, and the garden was a new tomb in which no one had been laid. Talked about this already. Why a new tomb? No other body, no other visitors, no blame shifting. Uh, they, were, uh, they were permitted to put a seal on the entrance They focused on security soldiers. Joseph gave up his tomb for Jesus. Are we willing to give up our throne for Jesus? Jesus is alive. He is alive. And like that tomb, for one person, like our hearts, one person. Either we're on the throne of our lives or Jesus is on the throne. And unlike the tomb, most tombs, most burial plots, the body is down and it will stay there until resurrection day. But for Jesus, he only had to rent a tomb. Three-day hotel. That's all he needed for his body. But sometimes we as Christians treat Jesus the same. Come to church, Jesus be the king in my life for an hour and a half. <laughs> no, when we invite Jesus in and we give up everything and let him sit on the throne, he calls the shots. And when he does that, then, only then, do we have fullness of life. And so, as next week we'll continue with the, with the resurrection, I want to remind us that this story was given. The fact that there has to be a death. And just like you and I, and here's the problem. We sometimes invite Jesus on the throne of our life, but we don't kill self. We don't kill ourselves. And so what happens is, even though Jesus is on the throne, he has to contend for his throne because we're forever trying to climb back on the throne. And we have to die, die to self. And as we die to self and let him rule and reign, watch life come through. Jesus has come, and John said that earlier in John uh, uh, 10. I have come to life 
to, to this earth to give life and to give it in, an, in abundance. And isn't it ironic that the one who came to give life had to give up his own life? But God gave it back to him and multiplied it over. And now Jesus is sitting in the heavenlies, sitting next to his Father. And best of all, he invites you and he invites me to sit beside him and there enjoy the fullness of life while we still have both feet on this ground. Let's stand as we pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for life, wholeness, and life that you give. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross so that we can live. Thank you for fullness of life. And Jesus, be on the center in our lives. Be on the throne in our, our lives. And we surrender again to you. We die to self. And we want and ask you again this morning to be in full control of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.